we're all real fans of comedy. I know you're still a fan. You still enjoy watching still comedy. Still love it. It's, you it's know, I've been going. I go to the fourth wall a lot, Joe Rogan, and I pay five dollars to do five minutes. And the rule is, you have to sit there. You know, most open mics you do your stage time and you leave. Right. You have to sit there and watch others. I was doing drywall work today. I'm what scientists call white trash as fuck. Do you know what I mean? I go there three or four nights a week, Joe Rogan. I pay five dollars to do five minutes. I'm no better than anybody else. But the main thing is, he asks me when I want to go up, and I always tell him towards the end because I want to watch these kids. And Joe, every time I leave there, bro, I leave laughing, and I fucking learn something. Mm. Just fucking eight people watching you do five minutes. But every time I go to the fourth wall, bro, I fucking learn something. My name is Joe Menente. I'm the owner and operator of the Fourth Wall Comedy Cafe and Studios. Expel! People that don't know me really well, they think that I take a lot of drugs. Buckle up for the fucking worst open mic of your fucking life. Because excuses are for losers, guys. I am not a loser. I am a failure, okay? I can already tell this is just going to be garbage. I can, just, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can just tell. I moved to my Los Angeles in 2004, July of 2004. I was in a rock band, and I that was my main drive, was to play music. You don't know what I'm talking about. The way you're living that thing, but I'm not I tried really hard uh, for about 10 years with that, and uh, comedy, I kind of did intermittently with the music. Three things you love the most. Your subpar singing, jokes, and undying self-belief in order to create the perfect formula for broken dreams. We had a lot of fun, did tours, we played a lot of cool shows all over LA and Southern California, but it, you know, it just wasn't in the cards. We were a little late to the game, I think, to make it work. And then after that, it was kind of cool. I just said, all right, I'm just gonna do comedy now and, and forget about it, you know? And, and the bitterness and, and, the, and the pain of failing at that has really fueled my comic point of view. If it wasn't for needing to support all, the, all these dreams, you know what I mean? Uh, I need to, you need to have some way of making money. So uh, it, it was first a moving company. That was my first business. I needed places to park my trucks and the studio out in North Hollywood that I have had parking for trucks. So I went there and I put the trucks in there and I ran it as a moving company and I subleased what is the fourth wall studio to a farmer's insurance brokerage for like six years. And then I just got sick of doing a list. I don't know, I just wasn't really charging them enough money. So I got them out of there and I thought, well, what would I want to do with this space if I could do anything? And I kind of uh, modeled my mic. I decided I'm going to do a mic called the fourth wall and it all just came to me as I was sitting in there one day, the name, everything. I even got a fortune cookie from Panda Express. It, I, this is a fucking fortune cookie. This is what it said. This is like so oddly specific. It said, build the stage, the audience is waiting. And it was like kind of prophetic because I did end up building a stage in that space at that time and people did come. It was like crazy. Right, you have a personality disorder? Yes. Anxiety? Yep. Depression? Yes. Welcome to Fourth Wall. You're gonna fit in great. Uh, you're up number seven. You guys look fucking hard as hell. Look at these men. Looking good, guys. Looking good. All right. Oh, is Four this video? Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. It's gonna be a bro cast today, you guys. Bro it's cast. just me and Joseph Menente here. That's right. Just us two. Nobody wants to hang out with us. Yeah, we don't really have any friends. <laughs> We're just here a lot. Uh. <laughs> uh, I'm Travis Clyburn. I am a stand-up comedian here in Los Angeles. I'm originally from Dayton, Ohio, or, well, a small town outside of Dayton, Ohio, and I originally moved to L.A. to do, uh, pursue stand-up comedy. I met Joe Benete in 2013. I had a buddy named uh, Jared Robbins. Jared Robbins is an actor. He's from Dayton, Ohio, just like me. He happened to move back from L.A. and work for my dad as a security guard. And then, like, I'd always wanted to move to L.A., but then I finally met someone who would live there, which would be Jared. And Jared happened to have, just so happened to have met Joe, and Joe just so happened to have started a moving company. I met Travis Clyburn in 2013 because 
my friend Jared, who was working for me as a mover, uh, was like, I got a friend and he needs a place to stay. He's a, he's a comedian. You guys should meet. I'm like, I need a roommate right now. And he moved in and he lived with me for the first month that he was there. I decided I'm gonna sell the moving company and get it out of my life and continue to build this little side business. Uh, I was also trying to rent trucks. That's why the sign still says fourth wall production supply and trunk, truck rental. And if you gave, if I put, if, if I could have bet on which aspect of the business was gonna survive, the open mic or the truck rental, I'd have put money on the truck rental for sure. And of course that failed immediately. And then uh, the open mic thing kept going, you know. I moved to LA for the second time uh, with a girl I met in Virginia. And then we broke up and then I just didn't have a place to live. Like, I was just like, so in the, I knew Menente from being a mover once upon a time. And uh, he was like, do you just want to live here and host mics? And I was like, yeah, let's go. So yeah. I needed assistance. I needed nights off and I just started putting Travis in there. And Travis is a great host. He really makes everyone feel welcome. He's, he's invested in everybody. He laughs. All right, let's get, uh, can we get a vote on I mean, he bailed me out of a terrible situation, really. And also, like, this is all I've ever wanted to do. And even though it was a weird way to do it, Doing it at fourth wall was doing it full time and making a living at it. I mean, I, not enough of a living to afford an apartment, <laughs> but a living, you know? So I lived in a van that he owned for a while outside of fourth wall. And then it got too hot and I just moved into fourth wall. And then I just did that until I finally uh, got a place of my own. You can't tell how dirty it is when all the lights are off, but as soon as those lights go on, man, oh man. Make no mistake, I didn't smell great, okay? That's why I'm glad I was in the back of fourth wall <laughs> you know sitting in the back of the house sits and like running back and forth i'm like i hope no one smells me uh but yeah that's you take showers at the gym and then you uh eat a lot of, eat a lot, you eat a lot of 7-eleven food which is why i'm fat <laughs> what's the best thing about doing comedy in la oh the best thing about doing comedy in la is definitely just the amount of opportunities you get um how often you can do it like, I mean, I host mics at 11 a.m. sometimes. Like, there's just ample opportunity. And if you start somewhere in the Midwest or if you start in you know, the South or anywhere else, really, other than maybe New York or Chicago, your opportunity for stage time is really limited. Uh, like, I think my first five years doing stand-up in Ohio, I could only do, like, an open mic a week, if that. And that's if you're lucky. And if you travel and you have the luxury to travel, then you can do, I don't know, two whole shows, two whole open mics a week, and uh, now I, you can do, hell, the most I ever did in a day was 11. So there's just ample opportunity out here. So I think, also it's, just take it more seriously out here in my opinion. Uh, just, there's actually a culture around it as opposed to just some weird thing weird people do at a bar, <laughs> other places. My name is Jake Kroger. And I am a lot of things, but my uh, life is comedy. I created this thing called the Comedy Bureau in 2010, which is a comedy institution, news source, curation hub. It's a lot of things for comedy in LA and now uh, New York. The number of open mics in LA, it's kind of, tricky to count them because there are open mics like there have been for decades that are like once a week at a place same appointed time same host there are open mics that operate like a small business so they run for anywhere from four to eight hours a day and they go every hour on the hour all those open mics are predicated on this sort of idea that you as an up and coming comedian, is it worth five of your dollars for five minutes of stage time that you'll only have to wait an hour for and you know exactly when you're gonna go up? Is it worth it? And for a lot of them, a lot of them it is. Because uh, the alternative sometimes is that you'll go to an open mic that's free, it's three minutes, but it's a lottery and they pull the names as the open mic goes on instead of pulling all the names at the top of the open mic. And uh, you might wait two, three hours and not even go up and you're just really angry. I started doing the hourly miking system in 2018, January 1. And it was very calculated to be that way. 
People call it the slotted system. It is, it's, it's the fourth wall system. It's, it's, a, it's a culture, and I mean, I wasn't the first person to use a slotted page. In fact, when we, it's an hourly miking system is what it is, you know what I mean? And the aspect of culture that it is, is it's about accountability and professionalism. Be, real simple, right? Be on time, stay for the whole mic. Runtime 50 minutes, very easy, you know what I mean? But yeah, that didn't come out of nowhere. It, it took me about a year and a half of observation to kind of figure out like, what do they have the patience for? It seems obvious now, like, but it, it wasn't at the time, you know, because we've been doing open mics completely inefficiently and fucked up for, for decades. You know, it's like, well, why haven't, why haven't we been doing this, you know, forever? I remember some of the people that came the first week, Ian Russo was definitely one of those people. It wasn't, structured like it is now it was just a first come first serve mic you know that's what it was the type of people that came through fourth wall changed over time and it also changed depending on what time it was so your four to six o'clockers your people who knocked it out early were always like it seemed like people who just started pretty supportive nice people then around seven and eight it got a little a little weirder but then the nine and the ten, fourth wall North Hollywood, will always go down as some of the weirdest, craziest people to ever do stand up. I've had to throw chairs at people, you know what I mean? I've lost my temper. Um, it's been documented. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a film out called Mikers, uh, which I star in that kind of shows some dramatic reenactments of uh, those incidents. So. so really, the people who came through fourth wall, it depended on the hour. Because I, I saw all types of humans. But man, the later it got, the weirder it got, that's for sure. I would go early in the day and yeah, it's great. Everybody loves what you're doing. Now, if I want to make sure some of the stuff really works, I'll go to a 10 o'clock North Hollywood fourth wall and really be in the room and it's just silence. But I love that silent room because if you can make four or five unhappy people at 10 o'clock at night on a Monday laugh, then that's gold. Put that thing in the, put that thing in the book. But at the end of the day, I try to explain to people, open mics, aren't for gratification, they're for repetition. I found Fourth Wall, um, gosh, it was so long ago now, maybe five years ago. I knew they were doing stand-up comedy and I had been out of it for a while because I had my child and I took like 10 years off and didn't do any comedy. And then when I saw Fourth Wall was doing this slotted idea where you are guaranteed to get up, that really worked for my schedule because like I said, I have a child. I can't just get a babysitter, go hang out at the improv and maybe get up. It's not good enough. Like I need to know I have time. So the idea of slotted where you pay five bucks, but you know you're doing five minutes. That appealed to me. All of the places that I've done slotted, I've, I've been happy with it because I've gone, I've had my spot, I've had a guaranteed spot. And then I could also see if, who else is on the list. So if it's someone who I really can't stand, okay, maybe not go. Or if it's someone who I really like, it's like, oh my God, this person's doing the mic. I'm gonna go and see them and hang out. So it works for me. Oh, it's good because you don't have to waste three hours at a place and maybe not go up. You definitely go up, there's 10 people. Uh, so that's good. Uh, the fact that they make money from comics is a little, uh, wakes up the revolutionary in me, you know, it's because it's like already we don't get paid and it's like they try to take more from you. So I, I'm ideologically against it, but it did make things easier. The people that criticize Fourth Wall don't come to it. You know, I think uh, the people that are willing to pay the money see the value in it. It's, so I, I don't have a problem with any of the criticisms. The rules that I've set in place kind of frame it in a supportive way. Be on time, be accountable for yourself, but you're also be accountable for the other eight people that signed up. Be on time, you're not just doing that for you, you're doing that for them and they're doing it for you. Anyone could say, well, I was being supportive. Well, really, you were five fucking minutes late. That's not that supportive. You were on your phone. Those are actions, that means more, you know? So uh, I guess if you wanna take support and dissect it into actually doing something, yeah, I guess I, I'm forcing you to be supportive in that. I'm forcing you to be on time and forcing you to stay and watch everybody. With something that, as consistent as like fourth wall Hollywood comedy, people are like, oh yeah, I can just go there seven days a week and like sign up and that, so they know that. The flip side, I think my criticism is, is sort of like a lot of people 
uh, who get into comedy have this idea like becoming mastered at something after 10,000 hours of doing it. And uh, that makes them focus on the quantity of going up rather than like, well, what you're supposed to do with those 10,000 hours is really like just work and fail and figure it out and not just like go through the motions for like 10,000 hours. So I've seen people like go up for years that have barely gotten anything out of like, like I know that they know how to take the mic out of the mic stand and then like move the mic stand to the side. And that's about it. That's about it. And uh, yeah, they, I think sometimes with the, the sort of accessibility that uh, a fourth wall would give where they're like, oh, I just like hit this fourth wall and that fourth wall. And then uh, that means like I got like three or four spots in the night, you know, in addition to those other mics that I did. And I'm like, well, did you really grow from any of that? Or are you just like trying to mark that you did these? And uh, you know, that really depends on the comedian. I think mean, like, I, I did too much comedy this year. I'm about to hit a thousand sets for the year and don't do a thousand sets of comedy in a year because it's not going to make you better. It, it's just not. And my name is Ian Ira Russo, and I make an ass out of myself for the sake of la. My name is Ian Ira Russo, and I make an ass out of myself for the sake of a laughing audience. <laughs> I call Ian Russo the uh, Beetlejuice of the open mic scene because if you say his name enough at an open mic, he just appears. This is this really happened. Okay, this is not how I met him, but this really happened. My dad, when I turned 29, came in for my birthday to visit. Uh, he sat with me through all these open mics uh, that I was doing at NoHo, and we went and we hit the town, and we just like went to two different bars. So all day he saw Ian Russo do time. We then went to Cabo Wabo. Ian Russo shows up at that mic. It happens to be doing a mic there. Then we go to another bar down the road, and Russo appears, and he's doing a mic there. The man is everywhere. Like, you can't shake him. <laughs> My comedy style, I would describe myself as fidgety, a little bit of a curmudgeon, and sh I yell a lot. <laughs> I'll never go after a comedian for their words, more or less their intentions, because I think if the intent is for a laughing audience, I don't think anything is off limits. I think you are able to say and do whatever the hell you want. I've never gotten in trouble for saying anything offensive, really. Like, I, uh, I, I think most people who know who I am know that I'm a pretty half-decent person, but uh, I, I've done my material that's gotten me into some shit. Yesterday, somebody was like, um, like, you, like, you know people think you're rude, right? And I was like, oh, this, this went completely unprompted. What brought that up? I was like, no, I just wanted to let you know. And it's like, all right. <laughs> this is going over well. How would people describe you now? God, how do... How do people describe me now? Wow. Ah, uh, at times rude, abrasive, standoffish. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the best reputation on the comedy scene. I'm definitely like consistently funny. That's not the thing that people know me for quite yet, and I'll take it because it's a process. People say these things about me because I, I don't know. I, uh, I guess I'm overly honest, which. I, I try to maintain some sort of authenticity because I think that's a lot of that's very important in a city of fake people. Which that's not to say that I'm a complete dick. I have a I have a good heart and I wish joy upon everybody. But I do know that uh, I know I could be a bit much. What do you think about Ian Russo? <laughs> Have you ever run into Ian Russo? 
haven't. Oh, you never run into Daniel Russo? No. Because um, he goes to like, he's kind of notorious for going to like 10 mics a day, so I don't oh, know if you've ever seen him, but no. you've never seen him. Have no. <laughs> <laughs> That's too much for me. 10 <laughs> mics a day? First of all, he's one of those people who I, I say hi to, and he just kind of looks at me and walks away, which, hey, you're lost. But he seems pretty harmless to me. Y you know, I, I would love a hello back sometime. But he, he kind of just seems like he's in his own world, because even, even when we do like the improv mics, he has a set. And it's a set, and there's no straying away from that set. He could use some pointers on that. <laughs> but it's a set. <laughs> the rooster. Um, well, um, Ian Russo is a, an interesting character. I don't know. I'm not a doctor, not a psych guy, but I think there may be a spectrum issue going on. I'm not judging. Uh, but I think that's part of the fuel component for him. Um, he's an entertaining guy. He's an interesting guy. I've met him a bunch of times. I've been at the improv with him a bunch of times. I've seen him perform a bunch of times. I've seen him do well. I've seen him do not so well. And, but then he'll, he'll be walking around, and sometimes he'll recognize me and say hello. I don't know if he knows my name yet or not. I don't, I don't know if we're on a name basis, not that object permanence of names, you know what I mean? But he knows my face, and I've done a bunch of open mics with him at uh, Fourth Walls and all that stuff. And you could tell there's uh, an interior going on there that's just somewhere else, deeper. He's a writer, I know he's really smart. Um, he's an interesting guy. It's, he's a, I'm not sure if I could call him a future friend or anything, but uh, I, I am interested, when he's on stage, I am interested in what he has to say. There, I feel like there's a, a point of view there that is not being addressed completely, and I like that. So. He's, he's a one of the comedian that changed dramatically over the few years. Because the first time I met him at the Flappers, because I used to host at the Flappers, he, when, he, when I first met him, like, damn, he's so offensive. Like, whoa. <laughs> but, so I didn't see him for a few years, because, yeah. And then, I, recently I saw him, and he's more aware, and then he's, he changed. It's still Ian, <laughs> but he's more like trying to catch himself and like, wow, I was like, yeah, people can change. Yeah. Ian Russo is really interesting to me because when I first was doing stand-up, I actually met him at the fourth wall. And the first hour that I was there, Ian Russo kept saying the slur for gay people. And he just said it so casually, it was very like, when I first heard him say it, it was very, very harsh, where I was just like, what is happening? And then later, a gay comic went up there and was like, looked at Ian and was like, how dare you say that? What do you, what kind of person are you that you feel you can just say that word, not even in a punchline, even if it was a punchline, what makes you think you can say that? And really, like, really yelled at Ian Russo. And I remember watching that and being like, huh, open mics are weird, <laughs> right? Um, but then, you know, with the slotted system, you pay for each hour. So that was hour one for me. Hour two, I stayed, and Ian also stayed, and so did that gay guy. And then Ian went up, did the exact same set, and still used the slur, changed nothing, and didn't even seem upset. And the gay guy sat there like, what? Like, are you just repeating your same thing? Did you learn nothing? And the gay guy was just kind of like, okay, I guess this is, this is how it's gonna be. And I remember I got, what I guess I kind of learned about it is like, you know, you can get mad at comedy, but are they gonna care? So maybe you kind of just have to like, just 
move on, which I don't know if it's necessarily a positive lesson, but it was a lesson. And I think that actually helped me grow where I was like, sometimes you can't change people and you have to just change how you react. Ian Russo is uh a local LA comic who moved from, I think, Philly. I'm originally from New York City. Ian started an open mic list during quarantine. Oh, here we go. Getting into the good stuff. I, as the comic bureau, decided that um, I wasn't gonna list any in-person stuff because uh, I didn't want to be party to furthering the transmission of the virus at that stage of the pandemic. So I started the LA open mic list because like during the pandemic, a lot of like I was getting up and in, in like on like sidewalks and parks, like whatever stage time that was there because bar bars, they weren't doing it yet. Clubs weren't open and people were repeatedly asking me and I, uh, I started posting the mics on my website like I have a page for it and it gained a lot of foot traffic and God, almost a year later, I'm now, uh, you look up LA open mics on Google, I'm the first thing that pops up way ahead of the Comedy Bureau, which I did not mean to happen. Sorry, Jay Kroger. You know, it's, other lists can exist, you know. Um, Far be it from me to ever want to like get into a dumb turf war. I think that is unproductive and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, they're free to do their open mic lists. And you know, um, I mean, I've been doing this for over a decade, so I hope they enjoy how much work it is because it is so, so much work. And I cover LA and New York and you know that i mean just trying to keep tabs on all that is an insane amount of um stuff um so good luck to him i've never let comedy negatively affect my personal life but it has affected my dating life in a lot of ways that i didn't uh really anticipate or expect and I've, I've been getting better about not letting it do that but uh yeah so i used to do this bit about this girl long story short there was a comic that i didn't get along with many many years ago who used to heckle my sets all the fucking time. Then I developed feelings for her. <laughs> and I started running a joke in front of her that went. Because right now, I have a crush on a comic. That's a crush on a comic. That's a little like being prison gay. <laughs> prison gay. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't ask for any of this. I mean, she's terrible as a comic, a person. You ever like someone who sucks personally and professionally? Like, I can date a bad person, I'm no stranger to that, but a bad comic, I gotta draw the line somewhere. That's, she's, uh, she's not actually a bad comic. Like, like I'm the better of the two comics. No disputing that. <laughs> I started telling that joke in front of her, cause what's the worst that could happen? And she fucking loved the joke. It was the only time she was ever friendly to me. So I kept doing the joke in front of her. It was like, all I wanted was for this girl to talk to me. So I just kept doing the joke. And she still heckled my sets. One time I was doing the joke and she was like, who's your crush, Ian? Name names. And I was just like, oh my God, shut the fuck up. God, you're pretty. What? Nothing. And then the pandemic happened. Lockdowns were crazy. All the barber shops were closed. And 
She cut my hair in a parking lot of a Fry's Electronics right down the street. And uh, she told me that I should give a lock of my hair to this crush. Digest that. She wanted me to give hair from my actual head to another human being. And I tried doing it and she ran to her fucking car like her life depended on it. That bit has caused a world of problems, but I stand by my art. That bit caused a lot of problems for me. Like, uh, before the haircut, the bit gained a lot of negative attention and, uh, which I didn't quite anticipate, and I admittedly played into it, like the fact that uh, so many people wanted to know who this comic was, and it, it just became, it, it was a world, I put her in a shitty situation in the sense that uh, for a while, I even hear people are still doing it, like people call her my crush to her face, and. At the end of the day, it was just a weird story that uh, we didn't really become friendly to each other until a couple of weeks before the haircut. And I don't know, I felt very guilty about it. And I, I, I just felt bad that uh, I gave this girl unwanted attention and it's a fantastic story like she like even she admits that like we had a good a, the good laugh about that story that we needed but uh, I don't bearing my soul Yeah, we're not on good terms right now for a lot of different reasons, and uh, I don't know, so I, I felt uh, it's weird doing, it's weird telling that story in front of comics, especially people who know who the bit is about. It feels inappropriate, frankly, to do a bit about a comic that, uh, I don't know. I, I just don't want this story to be the source of any more negative attention and I just want it to be art that audiences could take or leave. If she told me to not do the bit, I would calmly tell her why I can't do that because I feel like a lot of shitty people who tried to make, frankly, a silly situation that was not, it wasn't a big deal, a whole lot worse, and I can't let those people win. Like, it, it's a very complicated story of what exactly happened, and I don't, uh, it was a simple story at first, but after the haircut it became more complicated, and yeah, I can't, I can't let my enemies win in that regard, because I, uh, they're not consuming my comedy, audiences are. Do you think that comedy is sexist? Um, Stand-up comedy is embarrassingly bigoted in multiple ways. I've, I think that stand-up comedy is the least progressive entertainment form second only to talk radio. Um, I mean, podcasting's given it a run for its money in terms of just uh, like open arrogance and bigotry and, and contempt for marginalized groups. But people forget that a huge part of bullying is jokes and that comedians can be bullies. Yeah, my very first mic in LA, um, I was the only woman in the room and I should have realized that was a red flag. But I was like, that's fine. Like, I've been the only woman before. I went up very first and no one laughed at anything I said. I'd never experienced that before. I was like, oh, not even like a pity laugh, <laughs> like nothing. Um, and then after that, 
every joke was racist, rape oriented, homophobic. And I, like literally my jaw was on the ground because I had never heard that in Chicago when I had done stand up or even in Utah, which is a more like red state. And even after the show, after I sat through these people's horrific jokes, I tried to be like, hey, I'm, I'm Bethany, like make friends, just completely shut me out. And I left so disheartened, like, is this the right place for me? Should I even try to keep doing comedy here? Um, and it took me a minute to find mics that I really wanted to go to um, and that I felt comfortable in. And I eventually met other women who had had similar experiences. I actually find that I feel more in danger of being a woman than being Asian. Like I remember this happened to me. I took a class and it was during the day and the guy sat next to me. It was only the second class and he, I could tell he was attracted to me. And so while another student's up there trying to like do their set or whatever, the student next to me touches my leg and I'm like, that's weird. I didn't know what to do. I was like so stunned. But then the second time he actually put his hand down my inner thigh and touched my crotch. I slapped his hand away and I was like, don't touch me. And it caused everyone to stop like what had happened. So I later told the teacher, I was like, this guy touched me. I don't want to necessarily make a scene, but just don't let him come near me again. If I get sexually harassed, I will avoid that person and I will give my friends that I think he might go after a heads up if I see him talking to any, anyone. I'll just, you know, rumors are how, rumors and gossip are how women keep ourselves safe from predators. Whether men think that's legitimate or not, or, you know, whether they think that's the best way to handle it. Um, there are certain men that will be quick to criticize the way women deal with sexual assault, but they have nothing to say about the way that a certain men treat women and talk about women. And so if, they, if they've got so much to say about how we react to it and nothing to say about the harassment itself, I don't take you seriously at all. Hi, everyone. Um, I know that it's been a really long time since you've heard from me. Um, and when the news broke, um, I put out a statement that said everything I've done has been legal and consensual, and that's true. I stand by the fact that all my relationships have been consensual and legal. This was always about sex to me. It controlled my life. You know, having sex got a lot easier is the, uh, you know, for the lack of better words. Um, and I felt lucky. After Crystalia got caught messing with teenage girls, uh, which is just so despicable. I was just hearing so many people make the weakest defenses for his behavior when it was so black and white. Did y'all see uh, Chris D'Elia's comeback video? I'm proud of him. It takes a lot of guts to, to post a video like that yeah. and, and own up to yeah. the shit that you did and and uh, and that you want to fix yourself. So I'm, I'm very pro him. And I, I DM'd him this. I said, listen, you're one of the greatest comedians I've ever seen. But what he continues to claim in this video and, and the entire time is that everything was legal and everything was consensual. And so, and so, and he even said it multiple times more in this video. So I don't understand what apology he's exactly making in the video when everything was legal and consensual. All his relationships were legal and consensual. There was some other stuff that, although may not be illegal, Immor is highly immoral or maybe, from, a, got it. maybe a little more. I, I think you but, guys are both taking it wrong. So. I just started thinking of jokes just because I was thinking about it all the time and I was getting so irritated listening to these people defend him with this nonsense that I wrote like six minutes of jokes about Dalia. I did them at a park, an outdoor show, like, you know, just like mid pandemic and people really responded to it. And originally I was just going to do those like six minutes of Dalia jokes. And then I was going to do like 20 minutes of, of my regular jokes so I could give my manager a new tape. But um, then I went to go see Chris D'Elia perform at the Improv a week before I was set to film my, uh, my jokes and it changed the entire show. And I wrote an entire thing a week before and then I didn't think about the fact that like, I could have just postponed the show to give myself more time to prepare for this. Uh, but I just, I went up with it and I chopped it all together. Um, but I was just so angry seeing Crystalia on stage complaining about like his fiance 
complaining about anything, shut the hell up. Yeah, so uh, Chris D'Elia got in trouble. <laughs> Uh, Chris D'Elia getting in trouble is a lot like that clip of Kanye West interrupting Taylor Swift at the VMAs. Still funny. Uh, <laughs> if any of you guys don't know, Chris D'Elia is a terrible stand-up comedian who was accused of essentially trying to crowdsource child porn from his underage fans, whom he was also having sex with, allegedly, you know. <laughs> Uh, and look, before we get into all of that, I just want to say that Chris D'Elia is not funny at all. Like, I don't give a fuck how many people laughed at his jokes. People used to laugh at blackface, okay? Sometimes the audience is wrong. <laughs> I filmed Sex Criminal at the Fourth Wall Cafe uh, just because it was a venue that I could afford and I knew all my friends knew where it was and I knew they'd let us set up some cameras, so we just went for it. When I released this special, I was expecting a bunch of haters, but there was like the odd tweet here and there, and it was overwhelmingly positive. And um, I was really happy with that. I was like ready to fight hoes in the comment section. Didn't wind up having to really do that. Um, there'd be occasionally someone saying like, oh, this is not funny at all. It's like, well, a million people said it was funny and like seven said that they hated it. And usually the people that would tell me that sex criminal wasn't funny were like white guys and it's like you're not my target audience with this specific special it's for anyone who wants to enjoy it i'm not trying to exclude anyone but yeah some of these like straight white guys are like this sucks i'm like a woman being angry about sexism is a lot funnier to women than it is to men One time I went to the fourth wall for an audition mic and I was surprised most of the comics who showed up were women, which was like, fuck yeah, like women are here. They're going to get booked on this show. Like this feels great. Um, but the host after every woman had something shitty to say, like about their weight, about the way they looked, about one woman like saying she had a lisp and it was like so frustrating. like. Um, and I think this was at the cafe, the smaller one. Um, like, who are you to be making these sort of comments? Like, hosts can make comments on your set, and that's usually to be expected, but like, nothing connected to their sets, just making fun of these women. And then, no women got booked on the shows. Yeah, because I was like, oh, I didn't get anything. Reach out to all the other women. Like, did you get booked on any of the shows? No, no, no. The only people who were booked were the men who showed up to the audition mic. Every time I go to Fourth Wall, I see Joe, and I have a great experience. Was oh, Joe the think, host? No, it was not Joe. Oh, it was a different person. Yeah, it oh. was it was a guest one because when we all showed up, the doors were still locked. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I I don't think I have never met Joe. Yeah, I would call them out. Someone was talking about rape on stage the other day. Uh, young guy, he didn't mean anything by it. He wasn't attacking anyone, but it was making me uncomfortable. It was making a couple of girls uncomfortable. And I just called out, I said, uh, have you ever been raped? And he was, no. I'm like, well, have you raped? And he goes, no. And I'm like, all right, so what's your frame of reference here? You know what I mean? And it, it wasn't that you can't talk about rape. It's that if you're gonna do this, you need to package it in a way that it's filtered through your experience. And if you don't have any experience with it, there's still an angle to play there, but you have to think about what that is. Joe is great. And also I like him a lot because one time I was at the cafe and I was just there for open mic and he was hosting. And one of the comedian was trying to take picture of the cafe worker and his, his butt, because she's a Latino girl, she has a nice, ass or whatever. So one of the comedian was trying to like take a picture of her but because she was facing, you know, on the ladder and then trying to change the sign. And so Joe called him out and said, hey, don't do that. That's, that's not, that's, you know, it's disrespectful. Don't do that. And then oh, that was like, oh, that was really nice of him to do that, yeah. I had a mic where I made this comedian crap. It's a whole thing. 
Let me tell you something about guys, and this is not me because I'm actually a very uh, sensitive person. I couldn't even come up with the word. I'm a very sensitive person. Yeah, no, I like cuddling and writing poetry about respecting women. Like, yeah. Yeah. Come on, these girls don't know me. Come on, come on, they don't know me. They, they would buy it. I have long hair, they would buy it. They don't want to be with you. See, they, what they want to do is they want to tie you to their car and show you around saying, look at this beast I can mount. Metaphorically, metaphorically, not really, not, not, okay, I'm not gonna be able to sell this. No. I'm a great guy, but my mind is like talking over me sometimes and it reveals who I really am, that my mother didn't raise me well. People told me, hey, like, you gotta be careful or not come back, which, uh, yeah, I had some bookers tell me, things like that, but I don't know, people I think understand that uh, for the most part, I'm not, trying to hurt people, it's just on the side, kind of. Like, it's really hard for women comics, man. I, I see how these guys talk to women. And I, I'm, I'm a person, I'm, I think I'm at a point in my career now where I have checked a couple comics. Where like a comic will bring up a female comic and be like, Hey, next, next comic, she's a female, trying to bring some lady energy up here, da 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 da. And, and I'll go up afterwards because maybe I'm headlining this, like, and this is actually happening, I headlined this particular show. And I was like, why you didn't bring me up as a male comic? Like, why you gotta let the world know that she's a female? Why, she, why is she not a comic anymore? Or if someone like, oh, you might have seen, he's, he's, a, he's the black guy in the show tonight. It's like, people like to divide, and that's how we stay divided even longer, by putting titles and stuff on us as comedians or as what our genders are or how we associate ourselves. When a female comedian gets on stage, especially at an open mic, there's gonna be a certain amount of guys at the mic that are like, ugh, before you even say anything. Um, work on being unique, uh, work on um, understand that when you're at an open mic as a woman and, and sometimes women will complain about like, oh, I can't get a date, I can't get laid in a room full of incels, you know, re read the room. Uh, those guys, they'll get irritated. I'll hear these male comedians that just get so in their feelings. If a, if a cute girl is like, oh, I'm having the hardest time on Tinder. And they're like, I would date you, but you wouldn't let me, you know? So I try to tell women like, be aware of that. Um, and don't take it too seriously when someone tells you like, hey, just a piece of advice. Don't talk about being a woman too much. Don't talk about being black too much. Not too much gay stuff like that, you know. No one ever says to Jim Gaffigan, hey, no more straight material. You talk about your family too much and your wife and your kids, it's you push it, you know? It doesn't happen to him. It only happens to marginalized groups that we don't really want to listen to what life is like for them because deep down in your heart, you know life isn't great for them and you don't care. Obviously, it's harder for a woman comic in this town because obviously there's just less spots. You, I mean, no one will tell you, but you gotta look at lineups and you see, okay, five dudes, one chick. Five dudes, one chick. That's how it works. And then, and then I just called them chicks. So there you go. See, I'm part of the damn problem. 45-year-old man, part of the problem. See, there you go. That's the problem. I can still go to two or three of the mics I go to a week. I'll be the only woman there. Even now. And I'll go to like 10 a week. At least three, I'll be the only woman. It's so odd. It's like, would women not have something to say? But it is unfortunate, it is still sexist. And you can see, you walk into the comedy store, even the improv sometimes, and you can just see some of the other male comics look at you like, they would rather you burn in hell. Like they don't want you there, they really don't. They really don't. And you know what I find fascinating is that most people that go see comedy shows are women. The women, there's mostly women in the audience, they drag their, their boyfriends or their husbands. But there are mostly women in the audience. So let's compare porn and comedy. Which industry is more dangerous for women? Okay, if I have to say, I think comedy is way more dangerous. <laughs> Speaking as a porn director, porn industry is very supportive of female performers, I have to say. The pay is better, and then the female performers have a much bigger say 
on what they want to do. And in comedy, you can feel like a female. Sometimes they really need to work so hard and to fight patriarchy. But that is very different in porn. Like if you are a woman in comedy, you don't have that much protection to begin with, and you need to protect yourself. You need to fight for that opportunity, and you probably will not be paid as much. And then you need to tolerate, or maybe you need to I don't know. Not tolerate. Like you will be harassed by male comics, and that is just not comfortable. But like in porn, if you are being harassed by a male performer, you can just be like, "Oh, I will not be working with that male performer next time." And you can say that you have the choice. But if you are a female comic, I believe sometimes you will be like, "Fuck, he harassed me, but I still need to do that show with him." Have you ever experienced any type of sexual harassment in comedy? Um, to be honest, no. Like, but I also think part of the reason I haven't experienced that is because almost from the moment I started, I had Travis. Like, you fuck with me, you had there's a three hundred pound powerlifter who's gonna end your day. Like, so I could see how I would not. End up experiencing that. I finally want to do something for myself to express what my opinions, my thoughts, uh, and, and also have my future wife yes. join me on this because I don't do well by myself. I have. Uh, this is neither why, of us do. That's why yeah. we're together. <laughs> <laughs> Codependency and my issues. Are da -da -da -da. I met my wife at Fourth Wall. Believe that or not, most people are shocked when they hear that. Well, she's also a comedian. Uh, she. Uh, comedian Dat Fan, winner of Last Comic Standing, uh, season one. He is this, a class and he teaches people, and she had just kind of started stand up. And then uh, Dat Fan would come and he'd bring his students and stuff like that. And uh, she would just happen to be one of the students. It was my first time that Dat Fan took me there. Um, we were walking up, and not to be cliche, but it was like legitimately a movie moment where he like, you, you know Travis, he's fucking like this. And he kicks open the door of fourth wall and like lights a cigarette and is like, hey buddy, what are you doing? And I was just like, <laughs> um, and for three months I tried very hard not to, what I told myself was I didn't want to shit where I ate. And the biggest thing was like comics not wanting to date each other, the very shit where you eat kind of thing and uh we just ignored that completely after a while <laughs> you make a relationship with a comedian work by removing all ego basically like there's there has to be no competition there has to not be like if someone gets more laughs than you that night like you can't be pissed when you get home like if you're pissed when you get home that's on you like you can't be doing that kind of stuff and just like constantly supporting each other, constantly knowing like, hey, like you're doing this thing that's like a weakness that I know of yours. Like I know you could do better than that. Constantly holding each other accountable in a good way, like makes both of us better. The best thing about being married to a comic is just that they get it. And being with another comic, like they get the, how long this takes. They get how much, uh, you know, how much crap you gotta put up with, how much stuff you have to do. And also, being with a comic, like we both, like nothing we say to each other really hurts each other when we know we're joking, you know? We're like, we can actually, I don't know, mess with each other and it's kind of fun. And it's also just, all we do is laugh all the time. I think it's awesome. A lot of people say like, I've had people say, I don't wanna date a comic because I don't wanna bring the open mic home. And I was like, well, don't. <laughs> I was like, I live this shit. I love it. It's fantastic. I get to do this all the time, which is also, I think, how, what got me through a job like working at Fourth Wall, doing so many mics. It's like, I love this stuff. Like, I would do this all the time, constantly. And so being married to it, it's not that big a deal. I keep, people keep asking me if it's hard, and it hasn't been, and I don't, I feel like I need to give good, like, advice, and I don't have any because it's just been chill. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, dude, a hundred, like, we might be the exception, not the rule, because it's, it really felt like luck. Like, even had Travis and I met two years earlier, 
Like, we both would have been so immature and absolutely hated each other as human beings. Like, to a point where we wouldn't be friends even a little bit. Like, so yeah, I would say just pure luck, pure circumstance. A hundred percent. All right, now I'm sure you all remember this next winner from our first season. He's the original, last comic standing. Please bring him to the stage with a huge round of applause, Dat Fan! From humble beginnings in San Diego came a relative unknown to the comic scene named Dat Fan. I knew comedy was for me when I was the only Asian in high school that failed math. There, there is a picture of your deaf ass behind you. Because we're friends, fucker! Why are you so hung up on DP? Did he, like, dragon kick I don't you know in the that, chest? I don't know who that is. I, well, I also want to talk about dad fan for a second. <laughs> I, I'm going to talk about dad fan for a second, okay? I, I, I want to bring his name up, but there's a guy that I'm obsessed with who's a comedian. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows who he is. I'm not going to bring his name up. Yeah. But he, he falls into that same, same category of, you're almost great. What do you think of Dat Fan? What do I think of Dat Fan? Oh, can't say what I really think. Really? <laughs> oh, what do other people say? <laughs> what do I think of Dat Fan? I don't like to talk shit, but I, uh, I met Dat Fan at a, at a New Year's party that Dave McNeary was hosting. And within five seconds, he told me he won season one of Last Comic Standing. And yeah, he's a good guy. Love him to death. What do you think of Dat Fan? Huh? Do you know Dat Fan? Oh, no, you don't know him. Dat Fan is, has been so loyal. I love the guy, you know, uh, that, you know, he is, more involved in comedy teaching than anything and he has a loyal following of people that get a lot of use out of his knowledge and uh, they do a ton of stuff they like to go to the 15 minute sets that fan is a great dude i was his student for about six months and it did help me like get started it absolutely encouraged me to like get started get writing um but i found the most value in just time on stage like going to mics just doing the time and also i ran out of money um so the the first one is what i tell people the second one is the truth <laughs> i didn't interact with him personally um but like it was kind of like everybody knew when he came in and was like oh my god he's here as a comic he's brilliant he's one of the best he really is on the on the la local scene yeah, I, it, when you see his name on the the open mics at Fourth Wall, you're kind of like, I don't know if I want to be in that room because he's just going to kill it. You're not going to be able to score off that, you know. The problem with that fan is that he runs a class where it's about five or six of his uh, students, and they dominate the room. So you've got five or six dad fan students plus dad fan plus what I would describe as civilians. And I've been in those sets and it's crickets and I'm up there because they're all on their own wavelength doing their own thing and then I'm an outsider because they're all taking the marching orders from dad, from general dad. He's uh, real strict and he runs his classes like a dojo, you know, it's, and I, I respect that. I've been like recommended his classes but then heard from other teachers that I've taken classes from that like, no, stay away from him. I respect what he's doing and I like the fact that he's local and that he's helping local p kids. But to me, it's like he's teaching them a certain way of doing comedy, which is fine. That's what a guru does. That's what a teacher does. But I'm also seeing like, yeah, they, they're, they're a little monocultured in how they're approaching their stand-up. So it, it, it's hit and miss. But I, you know, if, if a guy that, at that level of play wants to be at the open mics on the local level, I'm all for it, which is unique, because most of the guys that have experienced his level of success 
They stick to the comedy store, they stick to the improv, they, they're looking for those 15 minute sets on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You know, my guess is he's not in with Rita or he's not in at the comedy store, so he's got to do what he's got to do. And I understand that, but he still tours nationally and everything and he's making money. I remember the first time that I signed up for like a weekend open mic at the NoHo fourth wall and I saw Dat Fan there. And I remember thinking like, wow, I'm seeing the guy from Last Comic Standing. Because I still remember like when I first saw Dat Fan, I was a teenager. And I was a teenager in Kansas and it was so weird to me to see an Asian person on TV and like even though he was doing like the accent and stuff and people later gave him crap for it. But I just remember thinking like it was so inspiring to see someone at that level in comedy. And so he, it always kind of like shocked me to see him in real life. And um, I remember when I went to that mic though, it was such a strange experience. I signed up for Slotted and then Dat Fan put my picture on a poster as if I was on a Dat Fan show. And um, I, I was pretty new to comedy. And so I was like, well, I guess I'll promote this poster. And like, that was like a show that an audience member came to see me, but it was really a mic that just went like out of control. I have once done Dat Fan's uh, Zoom open mic during the pandemic. And then it was a, nice experience i think like he was very specific and organized about how he runs the open mic like he is very strict about the time you cannot run the time and then uh he's very strict about some rules like he will send you like a long text of all the rules of his open mic again which i think is good but also bad like everything has two sides like it's good because there are some rules so you will be like okay he cares but it's bad at the same time because it makes new comics a little bit nervous like because new comics will be like oh there are so many rules what if i accidentally overstep am i going to be banned and stuff so it just kind of keeps new people on the toes too much yeah did you ever do shows with that fan yes he kind of he, he, <laughs> yeah, yeah. when I was 15 watching you guys in high school yeah. yes you guys are both my comedy heroes on the same level man and, that, then, and you know what and, and that, that fan really helped me out in the beginning of my career I, honestly I know he really did he helps a lot of people he's out. a great guy right. yeah. did he um, you never paid him for anything though no okay yeah because he does those bringer shows. He does. Yeah. Actually, I, I was born in Vietnam, but I grew up in America. I play with American toys. I play with G.I. Joes. I love my G.I. Joes. You guys love G.I. Do you guys play with G.I. Joes? I love my G.I. Joes. But then I realized I was a Vietnamese kid playing with white soldiers for fun. How confusing is that? What if you just pretend like I'm G.I. Joe and I hold myself hostage? We're winning. We captured ourselves. What the? I believe whatever comedy materials he said as an Asian man is not going to be representative of all Asian American experience. But that's true to every comedian. Like with Ali Wong, Ronnie Chan, or Joe Kim Booster, like whatever Asian joke they have is just one aspect of being an Asian. It's not 100% of what it means to be an Asian. Because you see that when Asian people get pissed off, we all say the same thing, like you try not to laugh, they're like, what the hell? What the hell? <laughs> Crap you! What the hell? What the hell is this when we're mad? We're like moving our arms when we're chopping chicken when we're pissed off? <laughs> what the hell? Ch chicken's ready, chicken right there for you. Who <laughs> order? First of all, is he How plugged up? Does he have a, a microchip that says do a, a damn goofy Vietnamese voice every five minutes? <laughs> wow. You don't understand. You know, that fan in Vietnamese, that means not funny. Oh. <laughs> Don't Will worry. you please unplug from the Vietnamese matrix for five minutes, please? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, the thing is, if, if Asians do it, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, this guy, he's crazy. You know, like, I mean, I mean we're just, this is what we do. You right. know what I mean? We're basing it on the air. I mean, the stereotypes are part of the Go ahead, fellas. <laughs> I'm just saying, I read that article that complained about him. The thing that pissed me off is that they referred to him in the article as a comic, and I was really <laughs> upset. <laughs> You know, now all I'm saying is that it's 5:14 and that fan got one more minute left on his fame. So I think that he should. Have you ever experienced racism in comedy? Oh yeah. Like I mean, hecklers with in hecklers are like, you know, me me still love you or like I love you a long time. But I I always say you know, 
don't blow yourself. No, I know you can't love me more than 30 seconds. You know? <laughs> like, I have all the come no, I have all the comebacks. But hecklers I can't handle. But sometimes bookers or you know, people who in charge for the comedy, they're racist. It hurts me more than anything. Um this comedian was racist. I didn't I don't think he was he meant to be racist, but literally, like after I get off the stage, he said, "Oh, I need happy ending massage." And it was like I called, and I right away I called it out, and like, "Hey, that's gross. That's disgusting." And then, but he apologized. So a lot of people were just trying to be funny and being stereotyped but they don't know how like you know Asian female immigrant we are uh, we treat like prostitute or like sex worker and that stereotype and got me really upset but people think it's funny so yeah I love my space I love Iron Chef the one thing I can't stand is going shopping with my mom though seriously that gets really, you know, it gets really ghetto because my mom, she loves like coupon shopping. Coupon, double triple, coupon, coupon, come on, double triple. She was like, she doesn't need scissors, she just uses her finger. Look at coupon, double triple, coupon right there. Look at this, I'm Catwoman, coupon for you right there. It's so ghetto, like, like, but people at the grocery store hate my mom. They hate her, like, I don't, I don't even know if it's legal she does with coupons, you know what I'm talking about? She goes, look at that, fam. look at this, we have $500 worth of groceries, $500 after coupons, $10. Why you hate me? Oh wait, two more. Now you owe me ten dollars. <laughs> Ain't no holla back, girl. Come on. I like that fan. I think that fan has a lot of great information. Is he completely out of his mind? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> but I like that about him. He's intense as hell. I mean, he taught me a lot about producing a show. Um, I mean, hell, he introduced me to my wife. I can't be mad about that. And he also, he's got great stories about. Uh, starting and what the industry can do to you if they think you're great but you're not ready if that makes any sense because I think that's kind of I mean I don't want to speak out of term but like when that one last cut of standing I think he'd only been doing stand-up for about seven years and most people don't get that kind of notoriety until they're 10 15 years sometimes 20 years in so they have all the experience they have all the time they know what to do know what not to do uh, and then when he wins, like, they just start blowing just, uh, you know, a shit ton of smoke up his ass and tell him he's great. And he will be the first to admit, like, made a lot of enemies, thought he was better than a lot of people, wouldn't interact with a lot of people. And just having someone like that as a friend or just someone who can tell you stories, like cautionary tales like that, was awesome. Los Angeles is a showcase city. You never know who's in the audience, who's gonna see you perform. Like I get people to ask me like, hey, how do I start comedy? I'm like, where do you live? They be like, Minnesota, or they'll live in like Ohio or North Dakota. And I'm like, oh, you know, you can go to your local open mics, but eventually you want to leave there because you're not really gonna get seen for real. The reason why a lot of comedians aren't getting the opportunities that they can and I'm just assuming, because you never really know. There's a lot of comedians that do not adapt. And then when they see you start to blow up, they're like, man, how'd you do that, really? I'm like, how'd I do it? It was grinding. Like um, when we was going through the pandemic, people refused to do the Zoom shows. There was some comments that was like, man, I'm not doing that. I'm a, I need an actual audience. And I said, you know what? I'm going to jump in on these Zoom shows. A lot of opportunities came. I was able to travel the world and stay at home at the same time. Um, another thing that I did was I offered services. I learned how to take pictures, so I would reach out to people who had shows, and I'd be like, hey, let me take photos at your show for free. But, in the, but I want to get on at least two shows in the future. But a lot of other people w won't do that. They're just like, I'm just gonna reach out. I'm like, and offer what? Just, oh, no, I'm funny. I'm like, there's a lot of funny people. How do you stand out? So it's a lot of other work besides being funny in this industry that you have to do. How are you marketing yourself? Are you one of these 
like I get called, I've been called a sellout a few times um, by black comedians who are like, Willie, you need to go up there and just say every, just say the real, talk about black lives and this, this and that. I'm like, maybe eventually. Right now, I have, I know what my path is. I've heard a white comedian say, oh, it's gonna be harder to go up because they looking for more diversity. It's, you hear some, it's hard to be a straight white comic nowadays. And I'm like, would you wanna trade me? Because you still have a lot more opportunities than I have. You still have more doors and more people opening for you than there will be for me. So when you start to complain instead of adapt or about, e especially about equality, it's not, it's not even about full equality, just a little bit more equal. Like even when you look at the billboards or just the lineups of some of these big clubs, it's not as hard to be a straight white male as you think it is. When I first started out, um there, you know, be comics trying to grab my afro all the time, and you know, you'll hear you'll hear white comedians saying the n word at, at mics all the time, and I'm at I'm at a point where it's like I've heard so many white people try to be edgy by using racial slurs that I feel like I'm immune to giving a shit at this point, like emotionally. Um, but there's definitely a part of you that's like, all right, if this is, it's never worth it. The, the joke is like never funny enough to remind me like of slavery. A white person using the N-word makes me think of slavery and that bums me out. And so don't remind me of slavery if you're trying to make me laugh about something. When I first started doing stand-up, I naively thought that I could be friends with people, with like white people who use the N-word. And I naively kind of thought, oh, it's just jokes and comedians got to be allowed to say anything. but. You hang out with certain people and anyone from any marginalized group will tell you sometimes people will constantly joke about your identity because they're uncomfortable with it. It's not just, oh, I'm joking, I get to say anything. I'm from Portland, Oregon. I grew up around nothing but white people. You know, they would, they would all be laughing at these racist jokes. They were having a great time with it. I was feeling horrible. And just because they were people that I know doesn't mean that someone that I don't know can't tell a joke that makes me feel just as horrible. Some jokes are bullying, whether comedians want to acknowledge that or not. So, and, and this just happened recently. So, so and uh, there is a person who um, uh, fancies themselves a spiritual type and will say backhanded racist things. And so, the last thing, it actually was more homophobic, where the person was talking about something and mentioned AIDS, and every time he'd talk about AIDS, he'd look at me in the face. Mm-hmm. But he would say it in a way that, he would say it in a way that I'm like, okay, is he kidding? Which, it's not, AIDS isn't a joke, but he would, he's very sneaky and stealthy about how he couches it, and so, and then of course, you've got to kind of suss it out. Okay, so do I get up and do I say something? Or, you know, do I let it go? So what I've started doing, because at fourth wall, you can see where you go in order. If the person is up there, I make sure I go after so I can have a rebuttal. So it actually didn't stop you from going. Fuck that shit. I learned a long time ago that I'm not going to let some fucking racist ass keep me from doing things. Because if that was the case, I wouldn't do anything. If that was the case, if I was going to let some racist homophobic person stop me, I would have left LA a long time ago. The first time I was at the fourth wall mic, it was in NoHo. And I remember that um, I was still really shy where I would write my jokes on, I would type them out and then I would read them. But I was like so scared to read them, like my hands would shake and like the paper would be really close to me. And I remember that I did my time and right after me, this guy was like, isn't it so funny that that Asian girl was like a robot, just like the stereotypes? And I was just kind of like so humiliated and I was just like, I felt really like terrible. And then, but what I loved about it was that every comedian after him started making fun of him for being a dick. And I also remember that like the host that night was Joe Menente. And I remember he like, 
I think he was fake laughing, like, but not in a fake mean way, but more like he was just trying to be encouraging. So he would laugh at my jokes that I'm reading from a paper that I'm terrified to read, but he was just laughing to make me feel supported. And so I, I really always remember that. And I remember I saw him like months after that first terrible mic. And I was like, do you remember this moment? And he said, no. <laughs> He's like, I do thousands of mics. I don't remember you. But he was like, that's cool. Like he was just like, that's just how he is. He's just nice. And so it always kind of like stuck with me. Like that was my first like experiences in an open mic world where I was like, I got racism, but also kindness. Racism and sexism should not stop anyone from doing stand up. If you're scared because of stuff like that, then it just weeds you out. Because comedy is a very raw, it's very authentic. Like we were even talking uh, some of the comics outside where it was like, uh, I'm scared to do comedy because I don't know what to say. I'm scared of PC culture. I'm scared of getting canceled. There's comedians who are just like, they don't know how to navigate it and they just prefer not to do it. But if you let something like fears stop you from doing stand-up, then maybe it's not for you because it's only going to get scarier. It's once you get in on that stage and now you're putting the pressure on yourself to be funny and how do you entertain a bunch of people that's just like, all right, make me laugh. Every time you hit the stage when that silence hits, it's like, who are you? Why do I want to listen to you? We're going to eat you alive. I don't believe that clubs should be censored unless someone gets up there and says, I hate black people, or I hate gay people, or I hate women. Of course there's a line. Of course there's, gonna, there's a line. So if you get up there and yes, start spouting hate or like go Aryan Nation or shit like that, of course that should be censored. But it is a fine, when it gets to not so blatant things, it is, it's a slippery slope. It's very, it's a tricky sort of a thing. I even think this, this whole comics railing against cancel culture thing is, is kind of annoying to me because really at the end of the day, people have been saying this stuff for forever and people have been getting upset about it forever. Now you just hear about it. That's the only difference. And if you're a comic, like, if you've really got a great sexist bit and you really need to say it and you got to get it out of your heart for some reason, go for it, man. But just, you can't not expect backlash. Like, that's the biggest thing. Like, people look at it as a freedom of speech issue, and it's, it's not a freedom of speech issue. It's a not wanting to have consequences for the shit that comes out of your mouth. People who bring up free speech as it relates to stand-up comedy are all idiots. Freedom of speech protects you from the government, from backlash from the state. It doesn't protect you from anything else. It doesn't mean that you can't be criticized. And your audience has freedom of speech. They can hop on Twitter, say whatever they want. You know, these bloggers that, that criticize comedians, they have freedom of speech. If you can tell rape jokes, then we can write an article about how, no, I kind of don't like the way he does that. Freedom of speech works both ways, but you know, and you are allowed to say these things. There's there's comedians that still say all of these slurs and they're fine. They're not really facing too many consequences. It's it's hysteria. For you to 100% cancel somebody, you need to make sure every single person on this planet of Earth don't like that person. But that is impossible. Let's take Louis C.K. as an example. He will always have some fans. And there are always some people who want to buy tickets to see him. As long as Louis C.K. can generate ticket sales, he is not going to be canceled. This is capitalist. Louis C.K.'s controversial comeback is prompting a social media firestorm. The disgraced comedian performing stand-up over the weekend for the first time since admitting to exposing and touching himself in front of several women, but made no mention about those allegations on stage. Let's say Louis C.K. asked you to be on his lineup, would you do it? If we are talking about Louis C.K. specifically, no, because of his... Uh, scandals and all that history, then I would not feel comfortable doing that and I would feel I'm contributing to something bad to the world by doing his show. 
It would depend. It would depend on the offense. It would depend on the comic. Do I think they're funny or not? It also would depend on payment. If, it's, if there's money involved, I would have to consider it. If there's opportunity that could lead to other opportunity, I would have to consider it. Uh, the level of offense would definitely determine whether or not I would take it. If Louis C.K. is in a room and he's watching me do my stand-up and he's laughing, I, I would certainly feel a badge of honor, but I would also have a caveat to it where like, oh, this is a predator. So I have to weigh that in my mind accordingly. Can I handle it? I hate stand-up comedy as an industry and as a culture. And some people have been telling me that going out of my way to publicly talk shit about headliners and other comedians is going to get me blacklisted. It's going to cost me a career. But the way that I see it, I don't want to join stand-up comedy as a career. I'm, I'm okay with passing up on a career if it has to be that. If it has to be maintain this code of silence, then I would rather not be a stand-up comedian. I love it. I have so much fun with it. I feel like I'm good at it, but I am completely okay. I'm not trying to be a stand-up comedian harder than I'm trying to be a decent person. And there's way too much of that in stand-up. I find that clubs are not as diverse as the fourth wall because at the end of the day, Joe runs the fourth wall. Joe knows who we all are. And I know that if things were to get way too heated or out of hand, Joe would step in. We, I know that. I love Joe Menente. Joe Menente rocks. I mean, that room has made me so much better as a comic. Those rooms. And I've spent a lot of money there, sure. But it's money well spent. Like I said, it gives, gives me more time. Made me a more confident comic. And like I said, not every room supportive. I mean, some of those rooms aren't, which is good. That's a good thing too. It shouldn't be supportive. You shouldn't walk into a room and everybody go, yeah, yeah, you're amazing, you're amazing. Because some people aren't. Some people are bloody horrible. <laughs> and, and you need to be told that as well. I mean, sometimes things shouldn't work. But you've got, to be, you've got to have a space where you can throw stuff at a wall. I think that whole model that he's taken and made work could probably work in other towns as well, other cities as well. They're just not doing it. If I became a millionaire through comedy, I would keep this going above anything else. If I won the lottery tomorrow, I wouldn't stop doing this. It means a lot to me. It just engages me fully, you know, it holds me accountable financially. Uh, I get an opportunity to express myself artistically. I get a chance to encourage people. I get a chance to watch them grow. Um, I mean, in life, I mean, what else is there? You know what I mean? As a creative business person, I couldn't have created a better business for myself. I really enjoy every aspect of it. You know, it, it is... It's, it's really challenging and it's really complicated. And the fact that I can make a living doing it is really rewarding. Uh, and I would never stop doing this, never stop. The rush of being on stage, getting the laugh, acts as the elixir. That's the dopamine rush uh, that a comic can get. Um, you're after that, you're in search of that, it can become an addiction. I found that every time I quit, I would go back because that fix was in there. I needed to have it, I needed to have it come back. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it. So I'm like, why would you do that? It was horrible. Why, you know, why would you come back? It was terrible. Don't you remember that show? Was, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to do it. But there's something going on in my head where I'm like, no, nah, there's something there. And then I would come back, I'd get a huge laugh or something, or a great bit or something like that. And it would just all, it would flood the system and reset. And I'd be like, oh, that's why. That's why I'm here. This feels good. If you are paying your bills doing stand-up comedy, you have already made it. Everything else is a fucking bonus. Like, you don't... There's a lot of people who want to be the next Chappelle, want to be the next Bill Burr, but... Uh, if that's what they're striving for, there's a possibility they will never be happy. And if I'm on a show and I got paid 50 to to $100, that is a huge win for me. When I was an actor, my idea of making it would be 
making just enough money to like survive and like being able to pay my bills, being able to do that while acting. But for some reason with stand up, I feel like making it would actually be people knowing your name, knowing who you are and like having your jokes actually affect culture even in a minor way. I feel like that would be making it. What making it means to me, I don't really know, but like I do have meaningful work and it's, it's ongoing. I mean, look at Chris Rock slapping Will, or Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. Those guys, have they made it? They've been slam dunking it for two decades and there they are smashing each other in the face on national television. All right, is that success? I mean, they're not happy, clearly. You know, the, the, the one guy has to fucking make fun of another guy's wife. And the other guy has to go up there and hit him in the face. This is like sixth grade shit. So what is making it really, right? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, in certain ways I have made it. But in other ways, uh, I'm a million miles away. Sometimes I'm worried about you. Because some, you know, comedians, a lot of the comedians go through depression and you know, suicide thoughts. And then a lot of comedians talk about it. And some comedian, I can tell who they were doing this for attention, or not attention, or just more lighter, not that deep. But some people I'm really worried about, like, oh, he's not kidding, <laughs> he has bad thoughts. And then sometimes Joe, I feel like Joe has that, like, you know, is he's joking about it, but. I feel sometimes I feel that, oh, he really had a deep thought about, you know. So, yeah. Are you happy? Sometimes, and then sometimes not. But that's it. You know, that's life. Uh, I don't want to be happy all the time. I don't think being happy is important. Um, I, I, I'm coming to a point in my life where I was I literally having this thought the other day that there is a delight in discomfort. You know, it's just, it's, you know, I feel like we're very comfortable in our society. They like to lead you to believe that the world is ending tomorrow and all this shit. Really, people are living longer than they've ever lived and, you know, we're probably safer than we've ever been. It doesn't feel that way because there's so much information out there. You feel like you're being attacked from all angles. Nothing's really going on, you know? So that uh, discomfort, uh, like genuine discomfort from something that's not my own anxiety, like uh, being in a hot car with no AC, it's kind of a delight in that. I'm alive, <laughs> you know what I mean? Here's a real threat I can focus on. There's nothing to do with Russia or COVID or anything. My shitty car just doesn't have AC. And there's a delight in that kind of discomfort. I'm not happy all the time, but I'm learning how. I guess that's a part of maturity to just kind of embrace and sit in something that sucks. <laughs> and, and that's okay, you know? And that's it because it, there, you're never going to be happy. Those rich people aren't, nobody. It's okay. It's overrated. Just be where you are. <laughs> when it's not shitty, just try to appreciate it. <laughs> when it's not overly shitty, just try to appreciate it. Well, it's my mom on the line. She yeah. says, I hope you're doing well. Yeah, but I just hang up the phone because my life is hell. Yeah. She used to say I was the best, the head above the rest. Well, now I'm buying porn with my unemployment checks. Yeah. Fuck yeah! <laughs> you're five years old, so it doesn't really matter if your cereal is cold. Life sucks! Yeah. It's pretty amazing that a, that a guy like Joe, who's completely out of his mind, <laughs> and he'll be the first to tell you that, completely reinvented how an entire city does stand-up comedy. Like, a lot of people will say, like, oh, Marty's did Slotted before Joe. Like, no, Marty's used Slotted before Joe, but it was show up, go up, and that's what Fourth Wall started as. But, like, the man just decided to lock nine comics in a room with a host. That's madness. There's no way this is going to go well. And then, that was, hell, four or five years ago, and it is like the only way to do stand-up. There's a million slotted mics out there. There's a million places that tried to run it just like Joe and failed. I just, I think the guy doesn't get enough credit for 
changing the way the whole, like one of the biggest comedy scenes in the world does open mic comedy. So shouts out to Joe. <laughs> my car once and then the guy ran away so I didn't get in trouble but I was very shook and I was right next to Fort Walk because I just you know Mike I went there and I cried and like he consoled me then I went away so like he, him and I have been through a lot of stuff I offend a lot of people on his mics but yeah we get along I think he's a great guy he's uh, like I think he does he got looser and looser as a comedian because he does it so much 